so the uh, the subject of this lecture today is the ways in which um, feminist ideas have contributed to change in architecture and urban planning in the past three decades, and the reasons why these contributions are not acknowledged. To put this uh, uh, story in historical perspective, I want to describe the exhibition Women in American Architecture, which opened at the Brooklyn Museum in 1977. I was the exhibition's curator, but also a member of a team. And we conceived of the exhibition as an inquiry from a feminist point of view into the conditions surrounding the production of space, particularly domestic space in American society and the extent of women's participation in that production as designers, theoreticians, and users. More specifically, we were interested in exposing the ways in which the subordination of women was embodied in a space um, and the complicity of architectural design in that subordination. We also wanted to respond to the wide impression at, at that time uh, that, oh, I didn't know there were any women architects. Thus, this exhibition will be my starting point for examining six themes, six ways in which feminist ideas have contributed to changing architecture and planning, and where these contributions have gone either unacknowledged or misinterpreted. These themes include the design of domestic spaces, the change structure of the suburb, the development of new building types, the engraving of collective memory, our changed attitudes towards nature, and finally, women's culture and identity as a legitimate um, design paradigm. In the first installation of the 1977 traveling exhibition, the Brooklyn Museum had expected that we would mount the exhibition panels on the walls of their large Beaux Art Gallery meant for huge sculptures. I thought this mismatched of scales would guarantee that the exhibition would look insignificant in that space confirming the low expectations expressed by the museum's allocation of $150 as the installation's budget. <laughs> this amount was enough to pay for the nails to support the exhibition panels, the spackle to cover the holes afterwards, and some of the labor involved. Since one of the objectives of the exhibition was to demonstrate the great number of women in the field, I came up with the idea of a drafting room installation, a room where the women were absent, but their work was on the tables, whose bases were provided by Lionel Spear, the supportive co-founder of the Charette Corporation. So we used the $150 to pay for the red paint of the higher horizon for women. But the question of women's almost complete invisibility in architecture was already a bit behind the times in 1977. In the art world, for example, there was already public recognition of the existence of women artists, if not necessarily of the worth of their work. The question was instead, why aren't there any great women artists? And this was the title of a pioneer and very influential analysis by Linda Nocklin that challenged the assertion that there were no great women artists because women were incapable of greatness. That is to say, greatness as defined by the male establishment standards, a problem that I believe we have not been able to overcome in our own discipline. In order to fulfill the objectives of our project and to make visible the work of the women, our research unearthed at the Archive of Women in Architecture, 
we had to resist the very persistent pressure from some prominent board members of the Architectural League, our sponsor. They wanted us to reduce the number to only those exceptional women whose work would be acceptable to the male establishment. It would be a stronger exhibition, they said. The suggestion was also made that to supplement the very scant number of exceptional American women, we could have a few European ones if we could find them. Indeed, if we had followed their advice, the exhibition would have consisted of the women you could count with one hand, such as Julia Morgan, the protege of one of the country's wealthiest patrons, Phoebe Hearst, or Theodate Pope Riddle, Philip Johnson's rich aunt, who built her designs for boys and girls' schools with her own money. And these would uh, not only have frustrated uh, the right of all women architects to become visible, but more important, the very analytical objectives we wanted to achieve. One way, our way, of telling the story also entailed a significant break with the dominant way of writing architectural history, with the focus on the figure of the architect and his work, or on movements or styles. We focus instead on the social and cultural condition, conditions of production to reveal where women fit into the complex puzzle that um, ensured their invisibility. Since conditions vary in different contexts, we felt that to keep our analysis in focus, we had to limit ourselves to the US. The work of these architects was bracketed on the one hand by that of the far more influential domestic designers and trained architects who had conceptualized the home as a woman's place in society and on the other by that of rebellious women who sought to assert women's presence in the public domain through singular women's buildings at Chicago's 1883 World's Exposition and in Los Angeles in 1973-1975, the latter as a major cultural center. It is important to remember that the exhibition and the book did not happen in a vacuum, but almost at the end of a decade and a half of sustained feminist activism and social theory, which produced major structural changes in society, and in legislation ensuring, ensuring rights for women that we have taken for granted in the past three decades. These changes were not due exclusively to feminist activism and ideas, but would not have happened without them. They included, among others, accessibility to housing and education, and accessibility to non-stereotype jobs, the expansion of the range of roles a woman could assume, the broadening of the range of sensibilities and emotions suitable for public display, changes in the relationship between men and women, and the active promotion of women's access to political power. The six areas that I have identified are not exhaustive. I am sure that more in-depth research will reveal, reveal others. And although my design work has addressed all of them, I will refrain, re refrain from explaining any of the projects that you will see, not only because of time limitations, but also because I hope that in my case, you will go and look, you know, look at the website or else Google the projects that I'm showing. So we go with the first one, the design of domestic space. Examples of feminist-inspired redesign of domestic spaces first appeared in the 1880s, as we know from Dolores Hayden's book, A Grand Domestic Revolution. However, these radical plans envisioning major changes in the domestic routine 
had a very limited influence compared to the dominant model of kitchens designed to make more efficient the work of one single worker, the wife. That is why it is quite disturbing that at the 2011 MoMA exhibition called Counter Space, Margaret Schutz Lichowski's 1926 Frankfurt kitchen was presented as a great innovation of modern kitchen design because it replaced the kitchen come dining room of the typical German worker's house with an efficient separate small room. Schutlihotsky's design, based on Christian Frederick's application of Taylorism, pushed women into isolation within that space ignoring decades of feminist analysis and improvements about that very subject. So we see that even modern women can produce totally backward designs. And we have to be intellectually honest enough to acknowledge that modernity was not expressed in the design of that kitchen, but rather in women's emancipation from rigid domestic roles. Today, I don't believe any American designer would design a kitchen for a single female worker. Because the challenge is to design for the integration of all family members in the work of nurturing. The examples of feminist plans of the 1880s and later in Hayden's book expanded beyond the confines of the home into the design of neighborhoods. In these plans, domestic labor would be performed uh, in spaces equipped with industrial strength kitchens and laundries to be shared by several households. And although a few such cooperatives uh, within, um, it, with shared facilities were implemented in New York City in the 1920s, the idea became more widely adopted by the co-housing movement in the US since the opening in 1991 of the movement's first community, Muir Commons in Davis, California, designed by the architectural team of co-housing leaders, Catherine McAmont and Charles Durrett. Second, the change structure of the suburb. In my 1998 essay called Expanding the Urban Design Agenda, I wrote, quote, in the mid-1970s, when manifestations of male domination in American society were under attack as part of a large and diverse social movement against all forms of social injustice, feminist scholars and policymakers turned their attention to the limitations of women in traditional suburban settings. One reason for this focus was that women's uh, increased access to, the, uh, to education and their larger numbers in the workforce altered the separation of male and female roles, challenging the segregation of public and private worlds exemplified by the low density uh, suburban communities. Pioneering studies showed the relationship of housing and community design to economic opportunity and sociability for women. But while cities offer greater opportunities for everybody, the growth of suburbs seemed an irreversible trend. Scholars, architects, and community activists therefore promoted the idea that, the Amer that American suburbs should be more like cities, that is, denser and more urbanized providing better access to public transportation and placing services and amenities within walking distance of homes. Changes in zoning were seen as a priority in this effort because zoning was and is being used to exclude innovative uses of a space to respond to the needs of working women. Examples included the sharing of homes by single parents of different families working for pay in the home and the presence in the neighborhood of convenience stores um, and um, ad advocates for the poor also urge women to join the challenges uh, to restrictive zoning, which had the effect of limiting cooperative housing 
better women's shelters, other facilities uh, to marginal neighborhoods where there were higher crime, poorer schools, less public transportation, and fewer amenities. In the just over a decade and a half that follows since I wrote this, designers have introduced a multitude of initiatives to transform the suburb, including mixed use zoning and many new housing types. Between the new urbanism's upscale new residential developments, the so-called TNDs, or traditional neighborhood developments such as Celebration in Florida, available to a tiny and very wealthy minority, and Dolores Hayden remodeling of existing suburbs by homemakers organizations for a more egalitarian society, um, which she called homes, that included jobs within each community. There has been a momentum towards the enduring transformation of suburbs. The pending assignment was racial and economic integration in residential communities across the country. A very limited form of integration, only a few families at a time, was being implemented by designs of multifamily housing that emulated the look, scale, and materials, materials of large single-family residences so that they would blend in. A solution that, while being more acceptable to the white middle class, was clearly insufficient. It is only now, decades later, that the federal administration is making a concerted effort to integrate the suburbs, an initiative meant to offer poor minorities better opportunities for housing and education that is meeting very harsh resistance by conservatives intent on protecting exclusive enclaves. Third, the development of new building types, the definition of old ones, and the design of new construction norms and details. In the US, the integration of women into the labor force fostered the creation of new public building types since at least the end of the 19th century when wealthy feminist patrons like Bertha Palmer managed to force the inclusion of a woman's building in the Chicago Columbia Exposition of 1893. Unlike similar neoclassical pavilions at the exposition, this one included a large central space that was used for lectures on the dissemination of feminist ideas and also teaching events um, to share, among other things, knowledge about technologies to shorten the time of domestic labor. As we know, this new building type pioneered in 1893 uh, in the, this exposition was revived in Los Angeles in 1973, expanding its functions to become a major cultural center, an art school in California. There, hundreds and possibly thousands of women artists and designers got their chance to develop ideas in the fruitful company of peers, ideas that change our culture in this country far more deeply than the culture of architecture. A redefined type analyzed by Cynthia Rock was exemplified by the uh, women's clubs of the turn of the 20th century, founded by both white and African-American women seeking to show, quote, their strength and ability to shape forces in their communities, unquote. These buildings had programmatic requirements for spaces devoted to self-education that distinguished them from the men's clubs. Second wave feminists not only made Roe versus Wave happen, we also demanded that childbirth be restored to its natural fundamental nature instead of being treated as an illness. I still remember the little embattled group of feminist midwives that managed to open the country's first childbirth center in New York's Upper East Side in the late 1970s. A major victory of persistence against hostile bureaucracies and the medical establishment. They worked out of a remodeled old townhouse that they transformed in home-like suites so that the entire family could participate in the joyful event of childbirth. As we know, 
This was such a good idea that Obigin hospitals, afraid of losing clients, decided to co-opt. So they commissioned architects to change their typology, incorporating childbirth centers with luxury equipment like king-size beds and jacuzzis, many resembling five-star hotel rooms so much that the original purpose of the midwives became distorted. Childbirth was no longer considered an illness. It was now a high-end vacation. <laughs> Safe environments for women in the early 20th century meant the new type of residential hotel where young and married women could feel protected from the big city's male violence while pursuing careers. From the 1970s on, it was more likely to mean a shelter where battered women and their children could begin to reconstitute their lives away from male violence. This new building type and other related new types of housing have been notoriously difficult to integrate, becoming NIMBY classics. When I was head of Parsons, the um, Department of Architecture, I taught a housing design studio that had the participation of Sylvia Smith, now a partner at Fox Fowl. The studio originated in an initiative by Marjorie Perlmutter to bring a nonprofit developer, Community Access Inc., in contact with Parsons students for the design and construction of housing with an innovative program, combining apartments for former battered mothers and their children with the studios for recovering addic uh, drug addicts, creating a supportive community of people with complementary needs. Some students then would go on to work at Fox Fowl uh, on the construction document phase of the project. But it didn't come to pass. As gentrifiers in the Lower East Side neighborhood of the proposed site, ironically led by a former student of mine at the Master of Urban Design at Columbia, succeeded in stopping the project. My own contribution to the redefinition of a building type was the design of Fire Station 5 in Columbus, Indiana of 1985-1987, where the city's mayor a woman wanted to recruit and support women in the firefighting force. Finally, feminist activists have contributed to discarding the standard of designing for an able-bodied young male by creating a demand for more inclusive environments for different kinds of needs, from the redesign of doorways toilets, buses, and parks to make spaces accessible to people with disabilities and to parents with baby carriages. Four, changes in the way we conceive of engraving collective memory in the American city. The questions about those memories, how and where they are to be engraved in the collective experience have been of great importance to feminists. Women's history and the history of dispossessed peoples had, until the past 25 years or so, been invisible in the public realm, while statues and busts of entirely forgotten illustrious men remain in our parks and squares. My own proposal for transforming Ellis Island into a place for the celebration of the immigrant community's contributions to American society. And uh, Dolores Hayden and Sheila de Bretville's homage to B.D. Mason in Los Angeles are but two examples of inscribing forgotten histories in collective memory. There were also changes in the way war narratives were to be commemorated brought about by the decision to memorialize the v Vietnam War, a war that the US did not win, onto the Washington Mall, the country's most hallowed space of memory. Maya Lin's memorial was crucial in materializing this change, not because it was designed by a woman, although this in itself was important, but because the memorial itself was not heroic and did not resort to stereotypically male monumentality. Instead, she created the setting for the public display of private grief 
where the ritual of leaving personal mementos has become part of the memorial and of all spontaneous memorials ever since. I explore the reinscription of memory in a competition entry for the September 11 memorial on Ground Zero by designing a memorial as a place um, to reenact a collective cyclical ritual of memory necessary to turn any place into a sacred, sacred space. Fifth, the radical revision of our attitudes towards the preservation <coughs> rather than the conquest of nature and the emergence of su sustainable design, however you want to call it these days, I, I think that that is a tired word, but as an ecological practice. However, to do this huge topic justice would require really another lecture devote, devoted to it because the historic <coughs> equation of woman and nature has been at the core of the universal subordination of women in all societies. The replacement of an attitude of domination over nature by, by, by one of cooperation uh, with the natural processes is symbolic of the changes in women's status worldwide. <coughs> Thus, feminist ideas and practices may be one force contributing to the reversal of noxious practices which are rapidly deteriorating our global environment and which remain the most urgent challenge facing us all. Sixth, Feminist, uh, um, women's culture and identity as a design paradigm. This is not about the persistently annoying question about whether women necessarily design different from men, but rather about the ways in which designers have sought to incorporate feminist concerns and ideas about women's culture in their work. Feminist artists in the 1970s and 80s reintroduced the idea, already familiar to artists like Frida Kahlo and Tina Modotti in the 1930s, that art not only could make the viewer question the structure of society, but could do so by making visible women's different point of view. Some artists like John Semmel and Judy Chicago did this through figuration. But others, like Harmony Hammond, sought ways to infuse abstraction with a feminist critical purpose. Artists such as Joyce Koslov and Mimi Shapiro put the so-called minor arts of women's crafts on the same level as the major arts of painting and sculpture and reintroduced ornament after its long banishment from serious art. Public artists like Judy Baca engaged in large scale projects for murals or construction fences to make visible and generate pride in the culture and ethnicity of marginalized social groups who began demanding that projects of such kind be incorporated in community buildings being constructed with the help of government agencies. Some of these experiments found an echo in architectural designs, and here are just a few, very few examples, like uh, Mary Otis uh, Stevens' house in Lincoln, Massachusetts, <coughs> Saha Hadid's um, recent project for a stadium in Qatar, um, Venturi and Scott Brown's pattern and decoration, building facades and furniture. My own little house project inspired by quilt patterns. Benedetta Tagliabue's basket pavilion representing Spain in, um, in Shanghai, in the Shanghai Fair. Um, And Isabel Coichet's giant animatronic baby in the same pavilion. 
The few examples I've shown, <coughs> along with other visual research into the nature of femininity in architecture by Jennifer Bloomer and Liquid Inc., remain to be analyzed in the context of contemporary architectural practice, instead of being secluded into the spurious category of quote unquote feminist architecture. Unfortunately, we did not and still don't have the critical framework that supported the inscription of changes introduced by feminists in the culture of art. We did not have a critic of the stature of Lucy Lippard writing about the work of women architects or a feminist journal like Heresies, which was a critical instrument for the creation of feminist discourse in the arts for 15 years. We did not have the guerrilla girls, the self-appointed consciousness of the art world publicly shaming powerful museums for the pitiful percentages of women's work in their exhibitions and collections. But now that the guerrilla girls have extended the franchise to women in the filmmaking industry, taking on Hollywood, perhaps we should seek an architectural franchise that would take care of exposing the pitiful percentage of women in decision-making positions in most major architectural offices. Oddly enough, what still remains as a persistent stereotype is the association between curvilinear geometries and the feminine, as we can see in these recent articles about buildings designed by Saha Hadid and Ginny Gang. It is as, as if curves associated with arbitrariness and irrationality were the exclusive idiosyncrasy of women. This is peculiar, considering work by Oscar Niemeyer, Eero Saarinen, Frank Gehry, or Santiago Calatrava, and the widely spread use of software that has enabled the emergence of an architecture by, based on curvilinear geometries and complex forms. Yet, this stereotype of gender distinction remains waiting to be analyzed and exposed as a ridiculous and quaint memory of the past. I hope to have demonstrated that the influence of feminism in architecture, planning, and urban design has been powerful and multifaceted. Nevertheless, this influence is generally ignored in the histories and theories of the field, which nevertheless do recognize the importance of ideologies such as nationalism, fascism, socialism, or regionalism. Most of the reasons for this deliberate oversight or denial have to do with the conservative ideologies which arouse as a backlash in the 1980s, following the resurgence of feminism and other equal rights movements of the previous decade. It was during Ronald Reagan's presidency, 1981 to 1989, that the Equal Rights Amendment was presented but failed to be ratified for inclusion in the Constitution. The most powerful woman in the world at that time was the anti-feminist Margaret Thatcher, who believed that there is not such thing as society. Quote, only individual men and women whose duty is to look after themselves, unquote. For her, as she said, the battle of women's rights has been won. The days when they were demanded and discussed in strident tones should be gone forever, unquote. Another quote, the feminists hate me, don't they? And I don't blame them. I hate feminism. It is poison." Unquote. This view was amplified by the media, proclaiming that feminism was dead instead of being an evolving force. And the 1980s and beyond could be described as a quote unquote post-feminist era, while feminists were a stereotype as bra-burning men-haters. Nonetheless, in this same decade of the 1980s, women began to enter architecture schools in greater numbers, approaching 50% of admissions in Ivy League schools. They too defined themselves as post-feminists, thinking that the battle for equal rights was over. 
it would take another decade or so for them to begin to experience the effects of discrimination in the workplace in spite of their superior education. Issues such as sexual harassment, maternal leave policies, and the glass ceiling were workplace issues that together with race, social class, sexuality, and the openness to difference and the other became central to the agenda of third wave feminism emerging in the 1990s. In spite of the backlash, architectural offices and schools of architecture began very slowly to hire women. However, the conditions of hiring were rather peculiar, as illustrated by this personal anecdote. Shortly after the opening of the Women in Architecture exhibition, I received a phone call from the dean of a prestigious Ivy League school of architecture, offering me a position um, as, uh, uh, as an adjunct design studio faculty. When I called the colleague, um, the, the second woman to teach this ever, to teach design in that university, to tell her that there would be two of us teaching, studio, she said that the previous day she had been told that her contract would not be renewed. This was not because the dean was dissatisfied with her performance, he said, but because he needed to, quote, give another woman a chance, unquote. This was my first introduction on how women were to be given access on a one-at-a-time basis to the opportunities, benefits, and privileges enjoyed by men in academia and the profession. This phenomenon, known as tokenism, has not been exclusive of the treatment of women, but of all minorities, starting in the 1950s with the integration of Jews and later African Americans in predominantly WASP institutions. There is extensive sociological and psychological literature on the subject of tokens, starting with Rosabeth Moss Cantor's pioneer study, where she observed that because they are viewed as representatives of a group, tokens find their individuality compromised. To recover individuality, they must prove to themselves and to others that they are an exception to the stereotype. That is why some women insist that they are architects, not women architects. In the Wikipedia page about tokenism, there is a Woody Allen uh, um, routine from um, 1964, about his being hired by an advertising agency that illustrates this problem. He says, the agency, quote, wanted a man to come in, they pay $95 a week to sit in their office and to look Jewish. <laughs> they wanted to prove to the outside world that they would hire minority groups, you know? So I was the one they hired. I was the show Jew at the agency. I tried to look Jewish desperately. I used to read my memos from right to left all the time. <laughs> they fired me finally because I took too many Jewish holidays. <laughs> Whether selected because of their inoffensive, safe personalities or because their difference is expressed in an exotic and glamorous way, Tokens are highly visible and serve to create the appearance of inclusiveness. They are subject to a higher scrutiny by their male colleagues and superiors, and those with weaker performances are quickly replaced or more harshly admonished. Cantor argued that the problem of tokenism would wither away as the number of women in a particular workplace increase. But she did not anticipate the issues involved in the tokens adoption of the dominant institutional culture in order to survive and succeed. In theory, members of a disadvantaged uh, uh, group that are selected as tokens could contribute to social change 
if they use their higher status and privileges to aid members of their group. In practice, research by social scientists and psychologists has consistently found that tokens are unlikely, quote, to support collective and non-normative behaviors of members of the, the disadvantaged group, unquote. Tokens tend to identify with entrenched institutional values that want to maintain access under tight control. Thus, tokens, quote, serve as impediments to larger social change, unquote instead of paving the way for increased representation of the disadvantaged group. This is why women who have enjoyed the privileges of, of admission into the higher echelons of academia and the profession can claim, truthfully, that they have never experienced discrimination. And the advancement in an architectural career is, quote unquote, a personal thing, not related to gender. And it may also explain why many women in architecture have supported women's advancement in the profession as a principle, but have rejected being associated with feminism. Institutional, institutional and professional culture are stronger than individual dissension, and consequently, women have not challenged certain institutional values even when they are inimical to women's own best interests. In other words, we have met the enemy, and she is us. Today, when we talk about women in architecture, we usually focus not on discourse, but on the unfulfilled agendas of salary parity, and equal access to opportunities for retention or promotion, or on the difficulty to reconcile the demands of a very exacting, exacting profession with those no less time consuming of child rearing and the production of domestic life, as most women still bear the greater responsibility for both. More than three decades after our exhibition, we're still wondering what happens to the large percentage of women, currently 32%, that seems to disappear between school and obtaining a license, as currently only 18% of licensed architects are women. We continue to be concerned about the forces that compel women to leave the profession, which include the long hours, lack of recognition, lack of a clear path for advancement and low salaries, all things that can and should be changed and improved. And all this in spite of the fact that two women have achieved the Pritzker Prize among other international prizes, that a woman principal created a major and likely to be very influential skyscraper, and that there are scores of women that are partners of established architectural firms or principals of their own firms. It is not surprising then that there have been a recent resurgence of many professional women's groups such as architects, X, X. <laughs> Support, suggesting that a new agenda for feminism and architecture and women in, and in architecture can be envisioned, operating simultaneously in different fronts. For example, the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, could and should lead the effort to retain and promote the advancement of women in the profession. It could commission a national study to obtain reliable data about a variety of subjects, as it has been demanded by my young colleagues in the panel. It could convene a close conference with the country's largest firms to discuss how they can include or improve the number of women in decision-making positions and contribute to help women stay and advance professionally. It could run a competition to design childcare modules to be adopted by offices on a for-pay basis or as employee benefits. It could outline clear paths for promotion with a timetable based on the data obtained in the national study to be adopted by offices and universities. It could establish a special prize for firms that have achieved parity, like I believe Ginny Ganks has. It could establish an awards system that recognizes important areas of design and production that have a greater proportion of women such as detailing of project management, and that are as important in archi as, as architectural design in the creation of excellence. 
this is really only the beginning of a quote unquote, yes, we can list. Since the creation of this course is fundamental for changing a discipline, independent groups could develop an international journal about feminism and architecture. And what I have in mind is the model that allowed heresies to stay alive and influence the uh, art world for 15 years based on thematic issues edited by renewable collectives interested in a particular subject, always with the participation of a member from the founding collective. Or they could sponsor exhibitions on the model of the famous art show Women Choose Women that has been very recently revisited. Schools of architecture should, of course, hire and promote more women faculty faster. They should also take heed of the findings of scholars who argue that the respect of peers is a stronger factor of success than having a mentor. These findings suggest that mentorship by established women of younger women may be less important than the creation of opportunities for continued peer contact after graduation. This could take the form of forums or incubator spaces for these young graduates to present design ideas for speculative projects or competitions during those fragile years that, that follow graduation. Or the creation of online peer contexts shared by different schools, even internationally, with projects selected for presentation and review. To the academy and feminist scholars also falls the greater responsibility for A, undoing the damage created by recent anthologies that include the stunted representation of fem feminist theory in architecture, a topic abundantly explored in Karen Burns' essay, A Girl's Own Adventure. B, redefining the criteria for inscribing the work of women into history, challenging the criteria approved by the male critical establishment and C, to inscribe the work of women not merely by making sure the names of a few women appear in the histories, but by discussing their work in relation to that of men working with similar ideas. I can think of some potentially fruitful comparisons, such as Miss Van der Rohe's Brick House and Mary Otis Stevens' House in Lincoln, or in a more interested way between Peter Eisman's 1983 proposal for the Wexner Center in Columbus, Ohio, and my own 1980 Ellis Island proposal, proposal for a public part that included a historically fragmented landscape. I might, must leave this list in an inconclusive uh, state, as the conversation will continue in the panel uh, that follows. But I want to remind us that there is no conclusion. There never is. And that whatever agenda we propose to implement is valid for a few years only. The discourse on feminism and architecture will continue to evolve even as the number of women increases. We now need to formulate the questions for the next stage of its evolution. Thank you.